I'm Nathan Rutherford, and welcome to Myth Madness. Last episode, I began retelling the Greek hero Jason's quest to retrieve the Golden Fleece. This task was given to Jason by his cruel half-uncle, Pelias, who believed Jason was fated to kill him and so hoped a dangerous adventure would kill Jason first. Fortunately for Jason, the gods were fond of him. Through an oracle, he was given instructions to ensure his success, and the goddess Athena commissioned the building of a magnificent ship, the Argo, to carry him to his destination. With any ship, a skilled crew is needed, and Jason put out a call for anyone who wanted to gain honor and glory to come and join his adventure. From all across Greece, a number of heroes descended upon the town of Iolkos, made Jason their leader, and set sail for the faraway land where the Golden Fleece was kept. Last episode ended with the Argonauts' departure, and I'm going to pick up right where I left off. Leaving from Iolkos, the Argo passed across the Greek islands before reaching the coast of Ionia, modern-day southwest Turkey. The Argonautica poem lists a number of places they pass on their voyage, but I'm not going to list them unless something interesting happens there. The hero's first stop was at the tomb of Dollops, a long-dead son of Hermes. We don't know anything about Dollops today, but I think we can guess the ancient Greeks had at least a few interesting stories about him, enough to get his tomb a mention in the Argonautica, and for the heroes to pay homage to him. The Argonauts stopped outside the tomb and honored Dollops with a sacrifice of sheep. They stayed nearby for two days, feasting, drinking, and telling each other tall tales. The first major stop for the Argonauts was the island of Lemnos, off the coast of what is now northwestern Turkey. Lemnos, as the heroes would soon see, was a very strange place. Previously, all the men of Lemnos were exterminated. What happened was is they often went in their ships, raided the villages on the coast of nearby Thrace, and brought back many female captives to keep in their homes. At the same time, the goddess Aphrodite was angry with the women of Lemnos, because they had failed to honor her. So the goddess made it so that the men rejected their wives and only slept with the captive women from Thrace. The wives became jealous and one night killed all their husbands at once while they slept silently in bed. It's not a pleasant story. You have kidnapping, what is essentially the rape of war slaves, and mass murder. But one woman named Hypsipyle, the daughter of the king, spared her old father. She sealed him up inside a chest and threw it out to sea. And that probably sounds familiar. It's very close to what happened to the hero Perseus. The chest was later dragged out of the sea, and the king was rescued. Meanwhile, back in Lemnos, the women started wearing bronze armor and plowing the wheat themselves. They found the work a lot easier than the weaving and crafts women usually performed. But they feared raids from the Thracians, probably thinking they would come and take back all of the captive women, who the women of Lemnos did not release, or take them all into slavery in revenge. When the women of Lemnos saw the Argo approaching, they thought their doom had come. They gathered their weapons, and in a direct quote from Apollonius's Argonautica, poured onto the beach like ravening Thyades. In ancient Greece, Thyades were women who performed orgies to honor the god Dionysus. I think this line is supposed to mean that the women were enthusiastic in their preparations for a coming battle, but maybe this line is also supposed to foreshadow what comes next. When the Greeks saw the marching women, they sent Athalides, the fast-running son of Hermes, as a messenger. He persuaded Hypsipyle and the women to welcome the newcomers as the day was coming to an end. Hypsipyle, who was now queen, told the women to welcome the heroes, but that they should hide all evidence about the great crime that they had committed before the heroes arrived. The women invited Jason to come and meet Hypsipyle. Jason, when he got the message, went to the palace, and he dressed for the occasion. Around his shoulders he draped a beautiful red and purple cloak, made by Athena, and given to Jason while the Argo was being built. Like with a lot of clothing, shields, or armor the gods provide to their favorite mortals, this cloak is a work of art. The Argonautica poem describes various artistic scenes worked into the cloth. Cyclopses, 
forging the thunderbolts of Zeus, beating them out with iron hammers, a young Apollo shooting the giant Titos as he tried to drag Apollo's mother away, the twin sons of Antiope, Amphion and Zethus, as they were building the foundations of Thebes, the chariot race between the hero Pelops and the cruel king Onimaeus, a fight over oxen between two tribes, the dewy meadow beneath them drenched with their blood, and finally, and most fittingly, Phrixus, riding on the back of the golden fleece. Wearing his magnificent robe, as Jason walked by, the women of Lemnos watched him pass and swooned for him. He kept moving straight ahead. When he arrived at the palace, Hypsipyle turned her eyes aside, and a blush covered her cheeks. You see, Jason is not the fastest hero, or the strongest. He's not going to wrestle lions to their deaths like Heracles, tame flying horses like Bellerophon, or slither his way out of trouble like Sisyphus. Jason's strength is in his looks. Hypsipyle told Jason about the island's troubles. She told him how the men raided Thrace and brought back immeasurable booty, really two types of booty. At first, she says, the women put up with the men and their captured concubines, but soon the men began neglecting their own children and families. Unmarried girls and widowed old ladies were left alone to fend for themselves. In their homes, in the dance, and in the banquet hall, the only thing the men cared for were their captives. Their wives, mothers, and daughters soon had enough. Hypsipyle doesn't say that they killed the men. She doesn't mention it. Instead, she says that the women decided to not accept their men back when they tried to return from one of their many raids. She says that the men left to dwell in the snowy hills of Thrace, leaving the island to the women. She invites the Argonauts to settle among them, because the women were worried about the future of their community. But Jason says his trials urge him to continue his journey. He returned to the ship, but the young women followed him. They danced and brought gifts to the Argonauts, and eventually Aphrodite stirred a desire in the hearts of the heroes. This was because her husband Hephaestus didn't want the people of Lemnos to slowly die off. The women led their new men back into the city. Jason went back to the palace of Hypsipyle. The rest split up and shacked up with the others. The only hero who didn't join the women of Lemnos was Heracles. He stayed behind in the ship. He watched as the men left and the city came alive with dances, sacrifices, and songs sung to Aphrodite. The women of Lemnos weren't going to forget her this time. So the Argonauts' adventure was postponed. The sailing delayed one day and then another. Days turned to weeks and weeks turned to months. Finally, Heracles gathered the Argonauts together and forcefully reminded them of their quest. Did we get exiled for murder? Did we come here to find wives? Are we happy to stay here and plow the fields? We won't win glory staying with these strangers. No god will make the Golden Fleece move by itself. Let's go. No one dared to meet his eye. They knew they were shamed. They hung their heads and quietly prepared to depart. When the women found out, they all came running, like bees pouring out of a hive. Hypsipyle grabbed Jason's hands and prayed he would return alive with the Golden Fleece. She begged him to remember her, and hoped he would leave her pregnant. He told her that if he did not come back, and she bears a son, to send the son to Iolcos. With a final wave, Jason led the heroes back to the ship and departed. The next place they stopped was Samothrace. Orpheus convinced the crew to stop and be initiated into the sacred rites performed there. He told the heroes this would provide them with greater safety when sailing the chilly sea. Apollonius doesn't explain more in the Argonautica, he simply says he won't go into it, because the rites are secret, and he respects that. After that, they pass some more islands, before arriving at the land of the Dolionese. Their king, Sisychus, welcomed the Argonauts. He gave them wine and sheep, and they built another altar to Apollo on the beach to give thanks to the gods. Sisychus was a young man, around the same age as Jason. He could not yet grow a beard, and had not yet gotten his wife pregnant. He was so keen to meet the Argonauts, he left his bride in bed to throw a feast for the heroes and question them about their adventures. He could not give much information about the unknown lands on the way to Colchis, but he told them about an insolent and fierce tribe of monsters living nearby. The monsters were born out of the earth and had six arms. In the middle of the feast, these monsters rushed down from the mountain, leading a raid against the Dolionese and their guests. 
Heracles took out his bow and shot them dead one by one. In fact, the monsters may have been stirred up by Hera to give Heracles yet another challenge. The other heroes arrived and rushed to join the battle. At the end, the monsters lay stretched out on the ground, their bodies piled in heaps spread out along the shore. The anxious heroes wondered if more monsters were slinking around somewhere. They decided to leave Sisychus and the Dolionese immediately. They boarded the ship and pressed on into the night. What they didn't realize, though, was in the late hour darkness, the treacherous winds turned the ship around. They arrived back in the land of the Dolionese without knowing it. The Dolionese didn't realize it was the same heroes returning, and thought more raiders had arrived. Each group misidentified the other as dangerous enemies, and with clashing ashen spears and shields, they fell on each other. In the chaos of the battle, Jason killed the king Sisychus, while other Argonauts killed other champions too. Eventually, the Dolionese army broke, and they fled away in terror. When dawn arrived, both sides realized what had happened. The Argonauts were devastated to find the corpse of Sisychus lying in the dust and blood, far away from the bed he was supposed to be in with his new young wife. For three days they all mourned together and built a tomb for Sisychus. The widow hung herself. After that disaster, a fierce storm blew for twelve days and twelve nights. It made the seas so rough it was not safe to sail. The Argonaut Mopsus received a prophecy and found Jason huddling under sheepskin blankets. Mopsus woke the Argonaut captain and told Jason that the heroes needed to climb a nearby mountain and visit the temple of Rhea, the mother of all the gods. Once they honored her, the stormy blasts would cease. The Argonauts made their way to Rhea's temple. It's not a temple building per se, more of an altar in a grove of oak trees. They cut down an old tree and crafted it into an image of the goddess. With many prayers, Jason begged the goddess Rhea to turn away the storms. Orpheus had the men dance in full armor and clash their swords on their shields. Rhea showed her favor. The surrounding trees burst with fruit, flowers bloomed out of the grass, wild animals left their lairs and fawned around the men's legs, a stream of fresh water burst from a newly formed spring. They made a feast in honor of the goddess and sang songs. In the morning, the dangerous winds were gone, and they rowed the Argo away. Eventually, the men grew tired from all the rowing, so Heracles began rowing the Argo forward by himself. He rowed so hard, his oar snapped in half. One piece fell into the sea and was swept away by the waves. Heracles watched the wooden fragment disappear, and then he sat on the bench in silence, glaring around. Soon after, the Argonauts stopped for the night. They grabbed their wine and their sheep and hunkered down for another feast and sacrifice to Apollo. With his comrades busy preparing the food, Heracles went into the woods to fashion himself a new oar. He found a pine tree, with few branches and leaves. He lay his quiver and bow on the ground, took off his lion skin, and he grabbed hold of the pine and pulled it out of the ground. Grabbing his belongings and putting the pine over his shoulder, he headed back to the beach, intending to sand it down and turn it into a long, smooth oar. Meanwhile, Heracles' friend Hylas took a pitcher and went into the woods looking for a spring of fresh water. Hylas found a spring, and saw the spot where the nymphs held their dances and sang hymns to Artemis all night long. A water nymph rose from the spring and saw the boy close by. Her heart jumped at the sight of the rosy flush of the boy's beauty. As he dipped his pitcher into the water, she laid her arm around his neck, aching to kiss his tender mouth, and with her right hand, pulled his elbow, and plunged him into the water, either kidnapping him or drowning him. Take your pick. Only one Argonaut, named Polyphemus, heard Hylas's last cry. He rushed into the woods, wandering and shouting. He drew his sword, fearing some wild beast had devoured Hylas and was about to ambush him next. Polyphemus met Heracles on the empty trail and told him Hylas had disappeared. When Heracles heard, black blood boiled within his heart. He hurled his pine to the ground and took off, bellowing into the night. In the morning, the Argonauts woke up, and a perfect breeze for sailing filled the air. To take advantage, Typhus ordered them to board the Argo and set sail. They did, but soon they realized the three men were left behind. A fight broke out, and Jason, with his great leadership qualities, sat in silence. The hero Telamon yelled at him saying it was all too convenient that Heracles was left behind. 
He accused Jason of planning the whole thing, so he could have the glory of leading a victorious return voyage all to himself. Telamon tried to fight Typhus, but the two sons of Boreas held him back. This turned out to be a mistake. Many years later, Heracles met the sons of Boreas again, and he was still sore about being abandoned and killed them for stopping Telamon and preventing the men from searching for him. The fight threatened to break up the Argonauts completely and end the adventure. But the gods did not want this, and they intervened. Glaucus, a spirit of the ocean, emerged from the depths of the sea and spoke to the crew. He told them going back for Heracles would go against the will of Zeus. He reminded them that Heracles had labors to complete and was supposed to get back to them. He told them Polyphemus was destined to wander around and found a city. And Hylas was now the lover of a goddess. Great heroes they may be, they'd be fools to disobey the gods. With the will of the gods delivered, conveniently at the nick of time, Glaucus then wrapped himself in a wave, the water around him foamed and rippled, and then he was gone, back to the depths. Telamon apologized to Jason, and the Argo continued on. Next stop was the land of the Bibrytians. Their king, Amicus, was the son of Poseidon and the nymph Meli, so not technically a human. He was the most arrogant of all living men. He forced any stranger who arrived at his kingdom to fight against him in a boxing match, a death match. When the Argo arrived, he ran down to the ship and yelled his challenge. The Argonauts were angry, but Polydukes most of all. He called out he would fight against the king and led the Argonauts onto the beach. Amicus and Polydukes told the men to sit upon the sand in two lines. They each took off their robes. Polydukes laid his down carefully, taking his time to fold the cloth. Amicus threw his upon the ground in a messy pile. Apollonius describes Amicus as being like some monstrous son of the earth, so he is being compared to the Gigantes, the race of arrogant giants who fought against the gods. In contrast, Polydukes was young and not yet able to grow a full beard. He rubbed his hands together and bent his fingers back, making sure his hands were not numbed by the previous day's rowing. Amicus made no prep, or did any stretches. He only stood in silence, his face locked on his foe, ready to dash at him. Amicus provided two pairs of gloves. He told Polydukes to pick one and bind them to his hands carefully. He told Polydukes he was going to learn how skilled the king was at spattering men's cheeks with blood. But Polydukes did not reply to the taunt. He only smiled and took up the gauntlet at his feet. His brother Castor and another Argonaut helped him bind the gloves to his hands. When the combatants were ready, they raised their hands to cover their faces. Then they began, trading blow for blow, Amicus not giving any rest and Polydukes testing him out. Cheeks and jaws were crushed on both sides, until both took a break to gasp for air. They wiped their foreheads and then returned to the combat. Eventually, Amicus swung his hand down, but Polydukes dodged around him, struck the king above the ear, broke the bones in his head, and Amicus fell to his knees and died. With the death of the old king, Amicus's entourage grabbed their clubs and spears and rushed at Polydukes. The Argonauts rose in front of him, drawing their own swords. Polydukes's brother, Castor, took the head off the first man, while Ancaeus, in his bearskin, plunged into the middle of the fighting. After the Bebrytians were dead, the heroes asked themselves, what do you think would have happened if Heracles were here? They joked and agreed that there wouldn't have been a boxing match, because when the king would have issued his challenge, Heracles would have just smacked him with a club. As they chuckled, the heroes tended their wounded, made another sacrifice to the gods, and set up camp for the night. When the journey resumed, they next came to the seaside home of a man named Phineas. In Apollonius's Argonautica, Phineas is the son of Agenor, king of Phoenicia. He is the brother of Cadmus, the founder of Thebes, and that makes him very old. In a version recorded by Hesiod, Phineas is the son of Cadmus's brother. This would still make the man pretty old by the time of the Argonauts, but a little less so. The reason Phineas was so old was many years previously, he got the attention of the gods. Zeus granted him the gift of a long life. Additionally, Apollo granted him the gift of prophecy, and he used it to tell men the will of Zeus. But this combination of long life and prophetic skills came with a cost. Zeus also made Phineas go blind. 
Why the trade-off? The different sources give different reasons why. In the Argonautica, it's because he used his gift of prophecy to reveal divine secrets to humans. A big no-no. In this case, it was a punishment that came later. In the oldest source, Phineas's blindness was part of the initial gift-giving. Zeus told him he could live a long life if he accepted being blind. And in another version, the gods punished Phineas with blindness after he blinded his own sons. In any event, his blindness is only part of the problem. Normally, when the ancient Greeks went to an oracle, they brought some kind of gift or offering. Often it was food. But Zeus ensured Phineas would not enjoy any of the food strangers brought to him. Harpies, half-bird, half-women hybrid creatures, would come the moment anyone arrived at Phineas' house, swoop down from the sky, and grab the food before he could reach it. They would only leave the smallest crumbs to keep Phineas alive. Phineas was tormented by this, but also comforted when he heard the Argonauts approach. From his prophecies, he knew they were the band that would save him. He rose from his couch and crept to the door, limbs trembling, leaning up against the walls, until he came to a spot where he sank down and entered a trance. The men arrived. Phineas told them who he was and how the harpies were punishing him. He told them the gods decreed that the two sons of Boreas would stop the harpies. The sons of Boreas, Zetes and Calais, were smart. They knew that the harpies were a divine punishment, and if they ended it prematurely, the gods would punish them instead. They say they cannot help Phineas until he swears that they will not lose the favor of the gods. Phineas swore by Apollo that divine wrath would not fall on the brothers for their help. So the heroes prepare a feast for Phineas, to bait the harpies. Phineas barely touched the food before the bird women dropped out of the sky, crying and craving the food. They quickly devoured everything in sight and sped away over the sea. The sons of Boreas, who have wings and could fly, pursued them. Zetes and Calais almost caught them, their fingertips just grazing the harpy's tail feathers. But at that moment, the goddess Iris appeared next to them and stopped them. She told the brothers Zeus did not want them to kill the harpies, only chase them away. The bird women would not come near Phineas again, so they returned to Phineas, and everyone feasted together. In thanks, he foretold for the heroes a number of things that would happen to them on their voyage, warning them of different trials and how to get around them. But he couldn't tell them everything. He warned them about the clashing rocks that are not firmly fixed like typical cliffs, but instead regularly crash together and crush any ship passing between them. Phineas gave advice on how they can be passed. He described the lands they would pass through on the rest of the way to Colchis, and he told them to take any aid from Aphrodite as their success in the adventure would be up to her. Leaving Phineas, the heroes came to the clashing cliffs Phineas warned them about. Waiting with dread, they watched the cliffs as they closed in front of the ship, the water twisting and gurgling as the space between them decreased to nothing. When the way began to open, following Phineas's prophetic instructions, the Argonauts released a trained dove. It flew through the opening between the cliffs and reached the other side. The purpose of the dove was so that they could measure the time it took for the cliffs to open and close, and so determine how fast they would need to row. When the cliffs began to open once again, it was time for them to make their attempt. They rowed like they had never rowed before. Halfway through, the cliffs began coming back together. The tall, grey rocks moved steadily closer, cutting off their escape. It looked like they weren't going to make it. Soon the Argo would be crushed, and the hero's bones would be stirred by currents at the bottom of the sea. At that last moment, the goddess Athena intervened. With one hand, she pushed on one cliff, and with the other, she pushed the Argo the rest of the way. With her help, they escaped unhurt. The heroes rejoiced, clapped each other on the backs, and gave thanks to Athena for saving them. After, the Argonauts made a series of quick stops. Apollonius adopts what I call travelogue writing, listing out several tribes and names for islands. Not very many actual story events happen here. They see a ghost watching them from his grave on a beach. They enter a harbor run by Amazons, but leave before they are attacked. They see the god Apollo fly through the air in a chariot while the ground below him shakes. They reach the homeland of another tribe, the Marian Dini. This group was very friendly towards the Argonauts, they really wanted to meet Polydukes, because stories of his boxing match with Amicus had already reached them. As you might expect, there was a big feast, 
and the Argonauts told the tribe's king all about their adventures so far. The king told them that when he was a young boy, Heracles had passed through on his way back from the Amazons. This is a strange detail Apollonius included in the poem, as it's inconsistent with the details about Heracles that the poem has already given us. Previously, Apollonius mentioned Heracles joined the Argo after his fourth labor, and after being left behind, he returned to his labors. But this story by the king gives a later labor, and claims it happened years ago. It goes against the assumed chronology of the poem, and the wider myth world it was set in. It just goes to show another problem with trying to establish an order to the Greek myths. There probably was a generally assumed order, but different myth traditions played with it in different ways, so nothing was ever completely set in stone. It's also likely that the different poets, from Homer to Apollonius, weren't really interested in sticking to an established order. They wanted to tell a story, and they wanted to show that story within the larger framework of Greek myths. To do that, they needed to make allusions to other stories, but if they weren't all that consistent, it didn't really matter. The allusion itself was the important part. Apollonius used references to Heracles in this way. It's also not going to be the last time we hear about Heracles' labors happening in the background of this story. Besides giving us this example of the fluidity of myth, this stop among the Mariandini tribe is also the place where some of the Argonauts met their ends. Idmon, the soothsayer, was walking with the others along a river. As they passed by, a fierce white tusk boar leapt out of the bulrushes and gashed Ismond's thigh. He fell to the ground. Peleus and Idas speared the boar, but Idmon died in his comrade's arms. The loss of blood was too much for him. The Argonauts mourned their friend for three whole days. Then, at the same time, Typhus, the one responsible for steering the Argo, became ill and also died. The heroes were devastated, and the loss of their helmsman, their driver, almost stopped them from continuing the adventure. But the goddess Hera would not have it. She put extra courage in the heart of the hero Ancaeus. This is not the Ancaeus in the bearskin. This is the other Ancaeus I mentioned last episode, the skilled sailor, the son of Poseidon. Ancaeus's courage cheered up Peleus, who then in turn tried to rally the crew. But Jason, again being not the most courageous of leaders, asked if there was anyone who could steer the ship, and he wondered aloud if they were doomed to ever reach Colchis. Ancaeus quickly volunteered. With their new, enthusiastic helmsman, the Argonauts put aside their despair, sat on their benches, and rowed on for the final stretch to Colchis. As the Argo slowly approached Colchis, they reached an island inhabited by large birds sacred to the war god Ares. One of the birds flew high above the ship. It shook its wings and sent feathers falling down over the heroes. One of the Argonauts took a feather in the shoulder and revealed the feathers to be as sharp as arrows. Another bird appeared and swooped over them, but an Argonaut struck it with an arrow, and the bird fell through the air and landed in the water. In Apollonius' Argonautica, one of the Argonauts identifies these birds as the survivors from Heracles' fight against the Stymphalian birds in Arcadia. He explains how Heracles used a rattle to scare the birds into the air, and then used arrows to shoot them down. So what the Argonauts did was dress themselves in their armor and helmets and gathered their shields and spears. They approached the island and began clashing their spears on their shields to make loud noises. The birds took to the air in a swarm, raining down feather arrows on the heroes below, but the Argonauts fought them off. After surviving the Stymphalian birds, the Argonauts found some survivors of a shipwreck. Jason made the decision to rescue these people, and they were brought aboard the Argo. These newcomers are going to prove very important for the rest of the adventure. Their role and the Argonauts' arrival in Colchis and what happens there will be the focus of the next episode. So stay tuned, and thank you for listening. If you're enjoying this podcast, please share it with a friend. It really helps with spreading awareness of the podcast.